Namaste. So this time, instead of doing like a philosophical analysis with charts and stuff like that, for chapter three, or actually chapters two and three together, I want to do more of a broad look into how it affects us experientially, existentially. You know, if we take this knowledge to heart, if we really absorb what Lakshmi Devi is saying here, how does that affect us as human beings? You know, it all sounds so abstract and mythological huh? to a lot of people, I know. But it's actually a statement of how the reality is constructed. See, we're in a trap. We're in a trap that is constructed in a very sophisticated way. And because of that, we perform actions that actually lead us to be more entangled in the trap. So the point of the whole description of the cosmos and everything is to help us see the structure, the nature of the trap, and to get out. So first, let's look at the broad outlines of the plan that Lakshmi is describing here. She says there's two creations, a pure and an impure creation. Now, how do we experience that in actual life? It's really simple. Like most insights, you know, when you first get it. The pure creation refers to our internal experience. And the impure creation refers to the world, the externals. See? the world that we experience through the senses, and that includes the mind, is impure. Why is it impure? Because it's separated from God. It's separated from Brahman, the absolute. So the internal, and like I said, this doesn't include the mind, the internal, means intelligence and consciousness only. The mind itself is actually external. The mind is actually part of the body. It's one of the senses. So the only thing that is really ourselves <laughs> is our consciousness and our intelligence. So with our intelligence, if we can grasp this idea uh, that the self is not the mind, the senses, the body, the possessions, the relations, the actions, the reactions, none of that. That is all just the external world, the impure creation. Lakshmi says, I divide myself voluntarily into the doer, the object of the action, and the action itself. So that even includes perception. The perceiver, the subject, the object, the perceived, and the perception. This is the fundamental trinity. Oh, Peacock is here. I'll feed you in a minute, okay? This is the fundamental trinity at the heart of reality, the uh, ontological triple that is the basis of all experience. That's her. So you see how fundamental the goddess is to our actual experience? It's very deep. So, how we can gain from this is to start 
to look at our experience, to start to analyze and evaluate our experience. Oops. Confirmed. <laughs> According to these descriptions by the goddess of fortune, who herself is all this. So let me give you an example, okay? She says that she creates the jivas, the individual living beings, by creating ignorance, the illusion of separateness, that I am a separate being, a separate consciousness, a separate existence, actually, from God. This is the illusion. This is the matrix. Huh? This is the uh, maya. So if we take this to heart and we start looking at things, see, these are called upadis. There's a whole series, or actually a whole video on it. Upadi means a limiting adjunct that, that limits the existence and especially the consciousness. But the, an adjunct means something that's not really part of the self. It's something added on. So this idea or this perception this illusion of separation, this mirage of individuality, is actually the source of our existential aloneness. We did a video on that too. Existential aloneness is the tension, the, the separation, the pain actually, the suffering, the existential suffering that drives all human endeavor and experience. This is a huge insight. I, I wish you would get it. I was riding my scooter yesterday on the Girvalam path, which is a favorite pastime of mine on, on times when I have no work to do, or my work is finished, or I just need to get out of, of the house and think, you know. So I'm going down the path, and suddenly I had this blinding insight that everybody is walking around with this pain of separation from God. Everybody has this burden of this upadi, this limiting adjunct that I am a different being from God. I am a different consciousness from God. And then they go searching for God outside in scriptures, in rituals, in philosophies, in religions, you know, in big crowd events. Here in India, these religious festivals are amazing. They're huge, millions of people sometimes. Why? They're doing everything they can to distract themselves or to cover up this original pain of separation. And in the West, it's even more pronounced. People take to drinking, drugs, acting out all kinds of dramas, uh, sexuality, uh, the whole drama of family life, business, politics, government, uh, the whole, even wars. You know, wars are always led by somebody. And that person is dramatizing to cover up their loneliness. See, I don't know how, but all the Western psychologists seem to have missed this. Freud, for sure. The modern behaviorists, definitely. Even Jung, Carl Gustav Jung, avoided this point to the extent that when he was in India, 
He refused to visit Ramana Maharshi. I believe because he was afraid that Ramana was going to destroy this separation. See? And he, he tiptoes around it in his books. He doesn't ever confront it directly. See, so that's, that's why modern psychology cannot solve the basic problems of existence. Yeah, it can help with some of the symptoms, you know, but that's about all. Really, modern psychology misses the basic fact of human psychology, which is that we're driven by the pain of separation from God. Because God is the self. God is reality. God is love. God is beauty and pleasure and everything good. So when we're separated from God, of course, we miss him or her. <laughs> Just be patient, okay? Be hard. And that missing feeling, that emptiness, that alienation, or actually there's even a better word, anomie. A-N-O-M-I-E. Anomie means alienation from your own self. Back in, I think it was 1963 or 1964, Mensa had a big conference in New York about alienation and anomie. And nobody got this point. Nobody. There were all these sophisticated arguments of very intelligent people with long strings of degrees after their name. But nobody understood the point that the reason we suffer, the reason we feel separation, is that we're separated from God. The fundamental alienation is the fact of our individuality. And of course, most of us cling to our individuality like nothing else. Huh? This is the basic fact of our existence. And so, because we cling to it, because we reinforce it, then the suffering never ends. And we dramatize it in so many ways, trying to cover it over or distract ourselves from it, or fill that emptiness, fill that void with so many things, nonsense things. Huh? But of course, none of it works. The, you the, always come down from the drugs. There's always a morning after, you know, or the big party or whatever, or the concert or the rally or whatever it is, the war, you know. There's always, <laughs> when you come down from that madness of passion that we use to try to cover over the fact of our aloneness and loneliness, and it's still there. You know, it's still there. Passion is limited. There's only so much passion you can, you can stand, right? And then it turns into ignorance and you fall asleep. And you wake up the next morning, right back in the same boat. So, this experience yesterday I mean, it was so profound. It was so powerful. I had to stop the scooter and just sit there and watch all the people going by and see them, you know, holding on, clinging to their emptiness, to their separation, to their individuality, and feeling such great compassion for all of us, including myself. <laughs> that once I got myself together, I got back and I drove home and I just went into a deep meditation for several hours on this, confronting this upadi, this pain, it's a pain. It's a mental suffering, which is far worse than physical suffering. 
and penetrating through it and finding there the self. Now, there are many spiritual practices, meditations, and so on that accomplish this by indirect means. But I think the, the material in chapters two and three of Lakshmi Tantra really sets us up to confront directly the cause of our alienation, the roots of our anomie, our alienation from ourselves, our alienation from the self. And this is the great value of this Lakshmi Tantra. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. <laughs>